Hello, everyone. And today is a great pleasure for me because we have one of the giants in oncology uh, hosted here by OncoDaily, uh, Dr. Francois Mounier. Uh, doc, uh, it's, I mean, uh, it's very difficult to, de, to introduce all the awards and distinctions Dr. Mounier had during her uh, very productive and long career, but I'll try to make a short introduction before we start the interview. So uh, Dr. Francois Mounier has dedicated her professional life to improving the survival and quality of life of cancer patients. Dr. Mounier received her medical degree from the University Libre de, uh, de Brussels and completed a research fellowship at the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in the United States for what she received Fulbright Award. She holds a, master, holds a master degree in medical oncology and internal medicine and PhD, uh, again, from the University Libre de Brussels. She is certified in pharmaceutical medicine uh, from UK as well as in Belgium, and she is a fellow of Royal College of Physicians in the United Kingdom. She is a member of Belgian Royal Academy of Medicine since 2006, and in 2007, she was conferred uh, the title of Baroness by His Majesty the, uh, the King Albert II of Belgium. Dr. Mounier served as EORTC Director General from the 1991 through 2015 and oversaw the growth of the EORTC into an international world-class cancer clinical research infrastructure. Upon stepping down as Director General in 2015, Francois uh, Mounier remained active as EORTC Director of Special Projects until November 9, 2018. And today is November 8, when we are recording, basically. It's an anniversary. Yeah, where she was a driving force behind activities such as URTC cancer survivorship initiatives. Since 2014, she has been leading an initiative on the right to be forgotten for cancer survivors, advocating for the creation of a harmonized European legal framework to tackle discrimination against cancer survivors. In November 2018, Dr. Mounier founded a European initiative on ending financial discrimination against cancer survivors. Madame Mounier, thank you very much for being with us today. And uh, recently, Onco Daily also had uh, this uh, series of 100 influential women in oncology. And without hesitation, uh, our team uh, suggested that certainly we need you also there and congratulations with that and for all the work you have been doing throughout the years. And as I mentioned before uh, starting the interview, I was fortunate to be one of the URTC fellows back in 2014 and it was a wonderful experience for me and thanks for creating this wonderful organization. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, you have had a fantastic career. For over 24 years, you were leading URTC. And um, when you took over, it was a 28 full-time staff organization, if I'm not mistaken. And when you were leaving as a CEO, it was 175 uh, full-time employees and it became a multinational large organization and very famous one, very effective one. How was the progress? Uh, what challenges you had and how you made it happen? Thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to express um, my view on uh, what has happened in oncology in the last, uh, I would say 50 years, because next year it's going to be 50 years that I have been graduated as a medical doctor and involved immediately after my uh, graduation as an MD in oncology. Um, I was very much inspired by uh, the European atmosphere and uh, what I learned by uh, taking my specialty in Institut Jules Bordet in Brussels um, with Professor Tagnon. Professor Tagnon uh, was really a mentor and um, believed in, uh, in his young generation and push us to go to the States, to do research, to do a PhD, and to participate actively in uh, the progress in oncology. And uh, I was fascinated by um, the clinical research approach 
where we, uh, at that time, which was very pioneer in 75, 76, to tell to an European patient, to a Belgian patient that he had cancer and that we could try to identify a uh, more effective treatment by putting him in a clinical trial protocol, which were uh, not that often uh, performed in other hospitals, at least uh, at that time. And so I immediately uh, embarked with a lot of enthusiasm in uh, the possibility of participating actively in clinical research and in improving uh, the outcome of cancer. And uh, I mean, how was it difficult to, you took over for a, of a small organization and you made it like a large multinational organization. What challenges did you have during this time? Well, it was a, a lot of challenge. Uh, I was rather young, I was 41. And again, it's Professor Tanyon who, who once came to see me and say, don't you want to become the director of URTC? And well, honestly, I, I had not think of it, but uh, I immediately jumped on the opportunity because I believe in this uh, pan-European uh, collaboration. And so uh, it was indeed a major challenge because uh, the challenge were uh, the staff, the finance situation, uh, all type of challenges. Uh, and suddenly I had to become uh, not only uh, a clinical research uh, doctor, but also a manager. And so I had to become a manager. I learned on the spot uh, and um, I did not do all alone, but I was uh, very well supported by the board. The board uh, always uh, support my suggestion and activities. And um, that's slowly why uh, I could succeed in uh, putting EORTC as it is become. Uh, I have created also the fellowship program, the one that you mentioned, uh, because when I arrived, there were statisticians and data managers, uh, secretarial support, administrative support, but uh, I was the only medical doctor. And uh, having a background of clinical research scientists, I immediately uh, realized that I need a medical doctor with me uh, to make the link between the hospitals participating and the staff, the, the statistician were outstanding, excellent, but I've never seen a patient. And so I, I, I decided to create this medical fellowship program for MDs to be a type of link between the hospitals participating in our clinical research studies and the staff. And that's how uh, I had uh, more than 100 fellows. I don't know which number you were, but uh, there were 150 fellows uh, who spent at least one year, one up to three years, to be familiarized with uh, clinical research methodology. And I think it was a great uh, component of the success. Uh, uh, you were... You were a practicing physician before that, right? Didn't you miss uh, like practicing medicine? Why, I mean, when you moved to more administrative and research role? Uh, no, because uh, I think my uh, background from uh, 74 to 91 as a clinical physician at Institut Bordet and Memorial, uh, was uh, very helpful for me to understand the need of clinical research. And um, I had the, the, the hope and the, the feeling that by um, using my skills and expertise and previous experience uh, was very useful to improve the life not only of the patient that I could treat, but of all European citizens facing cancer. So it was giving another dimension to my impact, if you want. Yeah, yeah, certainly. 
So uh, coming uh, coming to uh, to the projects you started uh, back in 2014, and it was I mean it was my first also acquaintance with URTC, the uh, Cancer Survivorship Congress, and it was really wonderful. And still, when someone mentions which was the best ever presentation I have ever heard, I don't remember his name, but there was a person, most probably from Netherlands, who who just showed one picture and he was telling about his feelings what he feels when he's receiving his um, follow-up uh, labs and CT scan results and what his mother was receiving. So this was really amazing event. And still I have these feelings back from two, like 10 years ago. And you started uh, talking about the survivorship care and about the quality of life of those patients. And then you went to uh, organizing larger, uh, larger initiatives, I mean, please, can you can you elaborate about this and go also to the uh, right to be forgotten? Yes, as I was uh, reaching the end of my uh, professional career, I realized that it was extremely lucky to have witnessed in 40 years uh, of medicine, because in 14, I had 40 years of medicine background uh, with me. Uh, the tremendous progress that had been made uh, in oncology. And I think it's fantastic in one career to see uh, the, the, the progress. Again, in 74, when I was graduate, uh, announcing to a patient a diagnosis of cancer was a death sentence. While in 2014, it was already no longer a death sentence and even more so now. And so I said to myself, well, at the end of my career, we still have a brain and uh, I want to use my brain. And uh, that's why I decided to focus and to concentrate on societal issue of reintegration, the cancer survivor, those who are cured of cancer, when we medical doctors tell them that they are cured, uh, because they came back and say, well, but we have a lot of challenges. And one of the challenges which uh, struck me most is the financial discrimination. When you get them get to your normal life, they want to buy an apartment or a home, and they are facing tremendous difficulty either to get a life insurance or to get a mortgage because they are discriminated because of their past history of cancer. And so I, I decided that this is a niche, a specific niche where we can be positive and act and really uh, transform the situation on a pan-European level. And I was very much inspired uh, in 2016 because uh, in France, they established the first country, uh, le, le droit à l'oubli. And uh, I said to myself, if it's working in France, there is no reason, always with my European background of uh, working at the European level, there's no reason that other European citizens who have faced cancer, who are told that they are cured, could not benefit from the same situation that was built in France with le droit à l'oubli. And then oh, the whole process starts. I say, if it's work in France, it should work uh, in, in many countries and, 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 and aiming at a legal harmonized framework for all European citizens. Uh, uh, thank you very much. And so now it's getting progressed. I, I see that uh, a lot of countries jumping in, like in, in Europe, Brussels, the, uh, Belgium, the Netherlands, right? Luxembourg. Recently, I have seen you posted about Italy, right? So it's getting kind of, the issue is getting yes. more yeah, popular in terms of, um, it's like spotlighted, right? Yeah. Well, there are six countries in Europe, in the European Union, who have a legal uh, background, a legal uh, framework, and there are many other countries who have established a code of conduct, like Luxembourg, Ireland, and so on. And there are three or four other countries which are on the starting block and you are discussing with the ministry. So it is moving, yes, indeed, uh, the momentum is there, it is moving. Uh, 
uh, and as I always say, uh, there is we have seven years backup in France, so we have some guarantee that it is effective and working. And there is no uh, insurance company who have been uh, facing financial challenge or bankruptcy because of the introduction of the law in France. So uh, my message is not reinvent the wheel, take what is functioning in France and just adapt it to, to the whole EU. What about the rest of the world? I know, I mean, it's totally different, but since you worked with, I mean, globally, your work is not only uh, like limited to the European Union. I think you have some experience also. Uh, of course, the the problems are different in different parts of the world, but, uh, and some of the countries are challenging, just uh, challenged just to get essential medications, but it is, uh, I mean, very important also to, to raise the awareness for the survivors in those countries as well, right? Yes, I met uh, a person from Canada, from Quebec, who was very interested and uh, who perhaps is working on it also, but it's the, the legislation are so different, the, the healthcare system and so on, that uh, honestly, for, for me, my objective is EU and... Uh, I, I focus on EU, but I am not aware about other uh, major uh, in other continent. I would say. Okay, thank you. Uh, you are organizing a high-level conference on ending discrimination against cases of cancer survivors on February 15, twenty twenty-four, right in Brussels. Please, can you like give some more yes. details? Maybe some of some people would like to participate. Yes, well, it's going to be a very important uh, high-level conference, which has received the auspices of the Belgian uh, presidency of the EU Council. So it, it is a, a major recognition, I think, to be among the events organized under the auspice of the Belgian presidency. Um, we are going to have a beautiful agenda with uh, high-level uh, um, speaker and participants, such as two EU commissioners, Stella Kiriakides and uh, Meret Magilet, who are both commissioners and who uh, accepted to come and speak. It is going to be organized at the Palais of the Academies of Medicine, which is also a very nice place to organize I uh, see highly scientific event. Uh, we are going to have the Belgian Minister of Health and the Belgian Minister of Economy because it's always link between health and economy. So it is also uh, important that both accepted to come and speak, but mainly also patient testimony because I think it's extremely powerful to have in front of you patient who have faced an ordeal while getting cancer, getting treatment, and so on, being cured and say, and now having tremendous difficulty to go from three banks to four insurers to fill up paper and so on, to finally end up either with a refusal or an increased premium. And, and to describe all of those hassles, I think it's important. So we will have debate and uh, patient uh, cancer survivor testimony, which I think it's important, but also national representative from those countries who have the law and also discuss with uh, European uh, MEPs, member of the European Parliament, who were instrumental in the establishment of the report Unfortunately, uh, Dr. Véronique triel Noir, who was the rapporteur, uh, passed away in summer, and so she is not going to, to attend, but uh, I am extremely grateful to her for all the support that she brings in the European Cancer Beating Plant. Um, voilà. Yeah, it's going to be... We think, are going to yeah. have insurer representative as well as speaker, because I think as France show the pathway, uh, I invite the French insurer to be there and to explain his position. 
Yeah, uh, thank you very much. I think it's going to be a wonderful event there. And uh, just like a few short questions about like what would be your advice for the for the uh, younger generation in 2000, um, 2015 in your interview to Lancet, you said the biography of Jean Monnet should be required reading for every young person. Why? Well, because this uh, man uh, really impressed me a lot of his uh, persistence. You know, this book is fantastic because it shows all the hassle, difficulty uh, that he had to go through to finally achieve what he achieved with Schumann and create with others, uh, uh, Spark in Belgium, the, the European Union. Uh, and, and I think this... Uh, Facing all those difficulties, all of those challenges, and succeeding is really, it wasn't an inspiration for me, uh, definitely, yes. Last two questions. So, uh, what would be your, your, your take home message for, for the for those who are watching our interview and listening to you and especially for, for young oncologists, your physician scientists, how to achieve what you uh, achieved? Well, on a personal point of view, I would say that uh, you have to choose your mentor. You don't choose your parents. I was lucky my father was a surgeon, so I, I don't have anything to claim about my parents. Uh, I was educated in... A, in, in a medical environment, but uh, uh, you have to choose your mentor. It's really important. And for a woman, because after all, I am a woman, uh, you have to choose your partner. And this is very important because you don't achieve all what I did uh, alone if uh, your partner is not uh, in agreement with all what you are doing because this dedication requires a lot of time and, and as I say, dedication. So um, for the young generation on a personal point of view, you choose your mentor, you choose your partner. Those are extremely important. Um, another important message is that um, when I look back at, at my career now, almost 50 years, uh, I think it is, um, fantastic for oncology and for patients to see that there is the light at the end of the tunnel, that we are curing more and more patients, and then now that the society has to move and to uh, end discrimination and make sure that those patients uh, recover fully uh, a normal life uh, after this uh, difficult period that they face. Yeah, very important messages. Thanks a lot. And the last question I would like to ask, I don't know, maybe on a personal note, many people ask you, but but I'm not sure if during the interviews anyone asked you, how is it to be Baroness? In 2007... Well, it, it was a surprise, but, because yeah. I honestly uh, did not expect, I did not do anything. Uh, it's something that you don't ask for. Uh, it was a surprise, but also uh, a sign of recognition. So I am proud and happy the, to have received this uh, major recognition from Belgium, uh, but it was a real surprise. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mounier. Thanks for the great uh, interview and thanks a lot for your time and for all the work you have done. Thank you very much. And thanks for everyone for staying with us. Thank you.